Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us on our first Business and Ethics podcast. Uh, as most of you know, the uh, Business and Ethics Conference for uh, 2020, which was May, was to be May 15th, has been canceled and moved to next year. And so therefore, though, we, we still wanted to keep the idea of uh, ethics in the mind of all of you, especially in these challenging times that we're in right now. And so we decided to start doing some interviews. And the first is uh, myself and Randy Redwitz. We are the co-chairs of the uh, conference and um, I'm the vice chair of the Orange Catholic Foundation as well. And so we bring Randy on. Randy, welcome. Thank you, Rand. Great and to be with you. Great, and Randy, um, tell me, before we get in, I know that you have a, a subject you want to talk to, but I'd like to know how you're doing right now in this current situation with your office. I know you've got a, a, a large public accounting, a certified public accounting uh, business and other holding companies. And uh, how's that working out? Well, it's a challenge um, like it is for so many others. I, I don't think we're as um, uh, negatively impacted as um, businesses that are absolutely shut down or have lost um, the majority of their business. Um, but we have all of our um, 145 employees working from home. Um, we're trying to uh, keep the spirits up. Uh, we have very frequent team meetings. Um, I have um, every two weeks, I do a, a report to the company all intended to try to keep communication flowing and um, keep spirits up. Um, we are looking right now for trying to phase back in um, the return of our people. Um, it certainly um, tells you in a circumstance like this how strong or how weak um, your technology is in the context of um, can you work effectively remotely and uh, we certainly saw some gaping holes, particularly in our tax processing. So it's a challenge. It's certainly a challenge, and I look forward to having everybody get back together here. Well, yeah, we, we have uh, been pretty good as far as the technology goes in terms of pe people being able to work for, from home. Um, in our business, we're property management, uh, commercial property management and ownership. Uh, we also have a brokerage entity as well. And uh, I think probably my job, my biggest job has been uh, similar to yours, Randy, is the CEO, keeping people up and motivated and that we will get through this. This too will pass and uh, we'll be on to better, better times. And that uh, don't be concerned about your job. We need you. We are an essential business. We have to keep the lights on on many uh, uh 70 shopping centers, office buildings, business parks. And so there's work to do. Uh, certainly a lot of work because we're in the process of working through tenants who are having challenges paying the rent during this time. So, so there's lots of challenges for us to work through. And, you know, ethics plays into this. You know, when you were telling me you've got 140 employees at home, the ethics of is, is being challenged by those individuals because there is a tendency, potentially, for an employee to, uh, to be goofing off. There's no one watching them while they're working at home. And just would like to get your feedback. One of the biggest concerns I had initially when we started going through this is, are they really working? And I think the reality is, is that uh, a, a, most of the people, and, and, and at least in Orange County, we'll just speak for the local county here, uh, you know, we've got good ethics and values, and, and I, I believe and trust in our employees that, that they will do the right thing. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I like to have these conferences. It's a reminder that we need to be true to ourselves and, be, and use ethical behavior and how, how we treat others. And frankly, to me, if you try to hide and, and you know, not get into a movie theater, not pay to get into a movie theater, something like that, uh, that's as unethical as you goofing off for two or three hours when you're getting paid. So, you know, hopefully we're not seeing a lot of that, but I'm just wondering if that crossed your mind uh, during the process, because you can't see the people. <laughs> you don't know if they're working. 
<laughs> At least that, that's gone through my mind. I'm just being frank about it. Yes, it's, it's uh, very true in that regard. Um, you do have that worry and um, you, you have to have a certain high degree of trust in the people that, that work for you. So, um, but certainly in a home environment, there's lots of distractions. Uh, there might be children there, there might be uh, spouses there to distract you. There's certainly the ability to get up and basically never get out of your PJs, you know, and, um, and work um, at your desk all day long, unless you have a, a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting. Um, but we, we do have a certain checkpoint that um, you don't have in your business, Rand, and that is um, virtually everybody in our firm has to keep timesheets. Ah. And, um, and those timesheets, um, I can review on a weekly basis, every two weeks, uh, every month, and I can look at chargeability. I can look at work hours. Now, you know, again, if you're, you're thinking bad thoughts, people are filling out the timesheets and not putting in the time. But I look at productivity, and, um, and I can somewhat measure um, the effectiveness that people are, are doing from home. So it has, yeah. has a little added balance there to it. Yeah, that's true. You, you've got the timesheets. Um, we don't have that, of course, but they have certain things. They, you know, they've got to get payroll done. They've got to make sure the bills are paid in the properties uh, that they're managing, the, the specific uh, project managers and property managers. And the accounting has their job to do. And uh, we're, we're really, one thing I can say, I know a lot of people right now think that the office market is going to shrink because uh, they figured out that, hey, some of these employees can work from home. And I know that's, uh, that's to be determined. We don't know how many companies will be really comfortable with that. I know that I really enjoy the synergy of having the people here in the office. Just the camaraderie of, hey, how you doing? How are things? How are the family? Uh, if I've got a question or an issue, I could walk over to their desk and put the paper down and we could walk through whatever the, the issue or the challenge is. It's, it's, I think, but yet there's the argument that you could be more productive by having the solitude of being in your home office and not having the interruptions you have at the office. So um, heads or tails, I don't, I don't know which one it's going to be. There, so. there, there is a balance for that. Um, and I think certain industries certainly uh, lend themselves to working remotely and others don't. I know in our industry, both our technology group and our CPA practice, we rely heavily on interaction to problem solve. Yeah. Uh, it's not that one person has all the answers in their head, but, but sharing that problem with one or two or three other people, um, you know, gets to the solution. And that's much more cumbersome when you have to email them, wait for a response or set up a Zoom call or a Teams meeting and get everybody aligned and properly positioned. And uh, so it's, it's more cumbersome that way as opposed to just, as you said, getting up out of your chair, walking over and, and talking with somebody. So it's a challenge for yep. sure. Well, it'll be a debate for, for months to come on, you know, is it more effective having uh, people work from their home office or the office? Um, but I got a question for you. You had a, uh, you wanted to talk about the paycheck protection plan. Tell me what, what your thoughts are on, on that and the ethics involved in receiving those funds. Well, I thought, given this podcast, that um, this was an interesting subject matter to maybe for you and I to discuss um, for a couple of minutes. Um, um, the um, so-called Paycheck Protection uh, Loan Program right now has obviously been center stage, and um, hundreds, thousands of individuals have applied uh, for this loan, and equally hundreds and thousands have gotten some portion of the amounts, uh, maybe in full what they asked for, maybe a partial of what they asked for. Um, but most recently, um, the Treasury Department um, has come out um, and the SBA and said, made a quality judgment on all the um, either applicants or those that have actually borrowed the funds. Um, do you really need these funds. And if you don't really need these funds, you shouldn't be applying. 
um, it's a very um, it's a very different tone than when the when the loan program was first initiated. Um, and so, um, but it's this whole ethical dilemma, do you really need the loan, is really coming to the forefront. And it's, and it's a question of, if you've got um, good business capital, if you've got cash in the bank, your business is running reasonably normally in this environment, um, you've got a full availability of a line of credit, do you really need this PPP loan to add on top of that? And, and, and then if you don't, if you make that judgment and you don't, should you return it? And some very large publicly traded companies have publicly returned their money. So it's a very interesting dilemma. Um, yeah, I, I think Notre Dame was one of the first <laughs> that, yeah. uh, that gave back their money. And of course they have a $14 billion dollar um, I think uh, endowment. endowment. So, so understandably so with them. I think the key thing here is what you commented about, and that is revenue. In other words, if your revenue is going to maintain uh, its current level, as we'll call it pre-pandemic, um, or it's increased as a result of that. For example, uh, a supermarket is probably a, a perfect example. Their sales are probably up 30, 40% over normal. Um, their staff is working, yet they qualify for this money. Uh, so to me, it seems like uh, it's fr free money from the government because for the next two and a half months, the government is picking up their payroll and their rent uh, for these places, yet their income has gone up, not gone down, or the revenues. And to me, that is a real ethical decision because morally ethical because you've got a government saying okay we're going to give you the money and as long as you follow these guidelines and the guidelines are that you you spend it on payroll and you spend 25 percent max on rent we will forgive that money there was never in the guidelines that you must be impacted financially right. by this so That's there right. is the moral dilemma that is absolutely right. Um, there is, there is a, a certification in the application process that probably people have taken very casually that basically says, I certify, in fact, I'm paraphrasing here a bit, but it effectively says, I certify that I really need this money. And people just probably have signed that very casually, like I just said. And, um, and gone on and, and submitted their application. Um, but now it's coming back to becoming a very substantial issue. Um, and here's, here's the way a lot of people are answering this, this moral dilemma, if you want to call it that. And they're saying, well, everything's fine today, but I don't know what it's going to look like a month from now or two months from now or six months from now. And how severe is this going to be? And am I, am I just at the tail end of, of good times and I'm about ready to crash next month? And so they're saying, I need the money to protect the future. And that's the way I think a lot of people are justifying this, right or wrong. Well, uh, Yes and no, because what you're talking about is they might need it for a rainy day, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, if, they, if they spend it on the same salary budget and rent budget they had last year, uh, it's forgiven. And if they don't use it for that, then it does become a loan and they have to pay the loan back. But Randy, is what you're saying that, okay, they're getting the freebie for the next two and a half months where they're actually going to double their profits because they now have their salaries and rent reimbursed. Uh, but that's okay because I may need it six months from now. Is that kind of what you're saying then? I am. And that's, okay. that's sort of some of the justification for, for applying in the first place. And I look fine right now. I'm liquid. But who knows a month from now or two months or three months from now, or how long is this recovery going to take and how am I going to Im be impacted? Well, I can tell you in our business, when I look at the 25 shopping centers we own, 
And in fact, just go into your local neighborhood and drive through a shopping center that doesn't have a market in it. Right. It, right. it looks busy if it's got a market or drug in it, but if it doesn't, it's scary. There's literally no cars in these huge parking lots because none of those small businesses and even chains, they're out of business. So one thing I do want to, to, to caution listeners, and that is even if they're a big chain, doesn't mean they're just loaded with profits and reserves uh, that can cover all the, the vast number of employees and locations that they have to pay rent on where their revenue is zero every single day. So there is there, there are even large, what we would normally call deep pockets that I think do need this money. I know Ruth Chris, for example, is one who said, no, we don't need the money. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. None of the Ruth Chris I know are in business right now. And their, their employees, no one's working. I would agree with them if, in the fact that they can't bring their employees back to work. So why do they need the money? I guess that's their logic, uh, which is the very honorable thing to do. In other words, you can't even help your employ employees unless you just gave them the money, kept them on the payroll, which is something they could do. They could use that to keep them on the payroll. So well, you know, I, I think that that um, is another angle of this equation, and that is um, the business that is out of business, or better put, the business that legally cannot open because they've been shut down by the governor or by the county or whatever the case may be. If that business applies and acquires the PPP loan, they can't even, unless they pay people to stay home, which I suppose they could, right. they can't even qualify for the forgiveness because they can't get back into business. Right. They can't pay the payroll. So they're, they're, they're doomed um, on the forgiveness uh, quotient. Well, and perhaps that's why Ruth Chris gave the money back because they thought, okay, we can't spend the money. So therefore it now becomes an obligation of Ruth Chris. So why not just not take the money because we've got to pay 3.75% interest on it. So we might as well just give it back. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so th that's probably a perfect example of why they didn't take the money. However, if they did take the money, then their obligation, in my opinion, should be to pay those people for sitting home if they're going to take the money. Because that was the idea behind this PPP was to get bring jobs back to, to the people. But what they didn't think out uh, was, okay, they legally cannot be open for business. So, but the requirement is once we fund the loan, you have to spend it over the next two and a half months. Well, right. if, if you can't open your business, you can't spend the money. That's so right. I don't think the legislature was thinking this through. They should have made the requirement that if you are legally out of business, uh, you cannot conduct business, you are required to pay your employees who are at home. And the, the problem is the employees right now can make more money on unemployment than they can on payroll, many of, many of the service workers in these restaurants. So I don't think it worked out quite the way they wanted it to. So. There are a lot of, um, a lot of facets of this that um, the, um, are still being interpreted. Um, there are up to 44 different um, FAQs relative to how to interpret um, uh, this CARES Act um, and more coming out every single day. So it's, um, it's an evolutionary process. And I think, um, you know, each person has to make their own um, ethical judgment on their need for, for the funds. And um, it's going to be hard to critique people um, in, in many regards. And so um, people just have to make the best um, moral judgment that they possibly can relative to taking these funds or not. Well, I think this is probably the, uh, from a business and ethics moral dilemma, I think this question of the payroll, Paycheck Protection Plan is probably the biggest one for 2020. It really is, here you've got a government saying, here's money that we're going to forgive. It's like free money. And, and for these restaurant owners and for businesses alike, to not take advantage 
uh, of, of that scenario, that's a tough moral and ethical uh, decision that needs to be discerned by all those employers willing to accept that money. Because here's, here's the biggest problem with it, and that is the fact is because if, in fact, we're not thinking, we're just taking, uh, that's why we run out within five business days. You know, we, they, they've run through $320 billion and now another $400 plus billion just is gone. It's vaporized. And, you know, the fact is it, it, it would still be around if the businesses who really needed it were the only ones who got it. So interesting topic. Uh, anything else that was on your mind, Randy? We're about 20 minutes into this. And, well, yeah. No, I, I thought that that was a very timely topic uh, for us to um, kind of share thoughts on together. And, um, you know, there is an element of this, Rand, too, that um, is really coming to the forefront now. And that is there's sort of a boomerang effect to the forgiveness. And the boomerang effect is that... Um, the expenses that go into qualifying for the forgiveness are not deductible. So effectively, that forgivable loan, which was supposed to be non-taxable, is gonna become taxable. Yes. Assuming a business is operating. Right. So there's, um, there's a lots, lots of different um, sides to this equation and, um, and um, qualifications for it, so. Well, it's ever evolving, isn't it? It is indeed, ever evolving. So, you know, what's next, just to give you, and stay tuned, maybe we'll cover this in another, another podcast, but um, it's gonna be interesting, for example, right now uh, on Monday, um, our, our executive team is getting together to uh, figure out how to reopen our office in terms of what are we going to do to keep our employees safe and protected against this virus as they, they come in? What's going to be the policy, for example, when visitors come in? Are they going to be required to wear masks? Are the people in the office going to be required to wear masks? Um, making sure that, that the, the, the workspaces are six feet apart. As you can see, when you go into some of the markets, and I, I noticed in Target as well, I was just there yesterday to get some things, and you know, they've got a, they're pretty organized on how, uh, how you get in and out of uh, the facility and, and stay in your distance. These are the things uh, we as business owners are going to be having to think about actually in the next two to three weeks, because it looks to me like, you know, the, many of the doors will be opening in phase two and phase three in the next two to four weeks. So something that we have to contemplate and, you know, there's moral and ethical decisions in terms of how much money are we going to spend to, to keep our employees safe. And you can't say money's no object. Money is an object, but we want to keep them safe. And, you know, where do you draw the line? Those type of things. And so it's a lot of, I don't know if have you guys thought about that yet. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we have. And um, we've equally have uh, plans um, that we've established and, um, in fact, I made an announcement um, on Tuesday to the firm um, across the board that we're going to start phasing in some comeback of individuals starting next Monday even. And um, it's, it's very interesting, and you have to be very considerate. People say, well, I don't feel comfortable coming back to the work environment yet. Yeah. Um, and um, so you have to be um, considerate and compromising in this situation the last thing in the world you'd want to say is, no, you've got to be back here. And then that person contracts the, the virus and, and has a problem. Um, so it's, it's, um, there's a lot of delicateness uh, that has to go on in, in the judgment call. And, and yes, the workplace has to be prepared as, to as safe an environment as humanly possible. So, Yeah, so it'll be... You know, I, I know we're going to hear those stories on the news, how, you know, employers demanded their employees come in and they said, no, I'm uncomfortable. You're fired. Yeah. And those are the kind of things we don't want to hear. But I, I know that's going to be out there. And, and it's tough. There's, there's a lot of, you know, businesses are hand to mouth and it's a challenge. It's like if they, they don't come back, 
you know, they can't afford to pay them. But that's kind of what the PPP was all about. So hopefully as we're coming back, we're still in the phases where funding was 10 to 20 days ago. So employee uh, employers have funds to bring their employees back or let them work out of the home. The good thing is in our firm is everyone is working out of their home right now. So if there are people that say, you know, I really feel more comfortable doing this, we will create an environment um, and until we know, you know, and, until the federal government says, yeah, we've got a cure or a vaccine or we can completely control this, uh, this virus, uh, we will let them work out of their home. That's just, we want them to feel safe and comfortable in their environment, whether that's here in the workplace or there in their home workplace. So um, I hope uh, employers like you and myself and others that take the lead on this and, and uh, show the path and, and be the example that we've got to work with, with the people that, uh, that work with us. Because, you know, it's great. You can call yourself a CEO, but you're really not a CEO of anything if you don't have uh, your, your, your partners with you in terms of the people that come in and work for you every day. They're the true people that make our company successful. So uh, we got to take care of them. Please. There's, a, there's an old adage, Rand, which I'm sure you've heard before, is that your assets leave out the elevator door every single night. Yep, they go up and down the elevator every every <laughs> night, unless you're on the first floor. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, you're so dependent upon the individuals that work for you, and you can never forget that. I mean, that's right. It's that whole reverse pyramid um, where the CEO really acts to support the organization, not be it on top of the organization. So, um, so it's. Um, Yes, you definitely have to keep that in mind constantly. Well, Randy, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, to join me in this uh, initial uh, business and ethics podcast. More to come, and I just want to remind the, uh, the audience out there that uh, we have rescheduled the conference, same place, I think the Irvine Hotel, and it will be April 14th, 2021, and we already have our Speakers have already confirmed, and we we uh, we think we're gonna have a really great uh, turnout because I, I hope people will have missed this one so much. Kind of like golf, they can't wait to get back. <laughs> so <laughs> so we will see you in here, but uh, we will be uh, reaching out with these podcasts from time to time. So thank you, thanks Randy, thanks everyone. Thank you, Rand. Bye. Bye bye.